Hey, I'm Sam. I'm one of the residents at Nepean Hospital and I'll be presenting to you a quick crash course into hyper and hypercalcemia. We'll go through all the practical aspects you need to know about assessing and managing these kind of patients so that next time you see a patient with a deranged calcium, you'll hopefully build up some more confidence in how to approach them. So when you're looking at a serum calcium, you need to know that that serum calcium is made up of three different components. There's a component that's freely ionized, and this is the bit that's physiologically active. So if it's high or low, it's going to give you your symptoms and signs of hyper or hypocalcemia. There's also a proportion that's bound up to plasma proteins like albumin, which you need to correct for. So for instance, to give you a clinical example, if you've got a patient who's got hyperalbuminemia, you might think that you have a low serum calcium, but when you correct for albumin, you might find that the um, ionized component of calcium is actually in a normal range and therefore not clinically relevant at all. Um, the binding of calcium to albumin also changes depending on the pH. And there's also a small proportion of calcium that's bound up to anions like phosphate and citrate. So if they're in excess in the, in the blood, for example, like in hyperphosphatemia, you can get a resulting hypocalcemia, uh, which can be clinically important to note. So let's firstly talk about hypercalcemia. And before we talk about the different causes of hypercalcemia, I'm going to assume that you have a good knowledge of basic calcium metabolism as shown on this slide that you're already well aware of the normal response that the body has when the serum calcium is low um, in releasing PTH and calcitriol to bump up the serum calcium. When these processes are deranged, that's what leads to hypercalcemia, as we'll see on the next slide. So let's talk about the different causes of hypercalcemia. And this slide may look very busy, but we've basically just superimposed in red all the deranged processes um, that can lead to hypercalcemia onto the diagram that you saw in a previous slide. So uh, before we launch into all the different causes, it's important to note that the majority of hypercalcemia is due to either malignancy or primary hyperparathyroidism. So the first major category to consider um, that causes hypercalcemia is that of um, excessive PTH or parathyroid hormone. And an uh, important cause of that is primary hyperparathyroidism, which we just mentioned, which is when you have a parathyroid adenoma or hyperplasia that's secreting PTH autonomously, irrespective of what the calcium level is. You've also got a mimic protein called PTH-related uh, protein, uh, which is secreted by certain malignancies, classically squamous cell carcinomas, and basically has the same effect as excessive PTH. Another major category to consider is that of increased bony resorption causing hypercalcemia. You have to remember that most of the calcium in the body is actually in the bones, and so it's a major source of calcium. And a key um, cause of increased bony resorption is malignancy from osteolytic metastases or multiple myeloma. But there are other rarer conditions which can cause um, increased bony resorption too, such as Paget's disease, immobilization and hyperthyroidism. You can also get hypercalcemia from increased calcium intake and that's called milk alkali syndrome. Um, you might have increased dietary calcium intake. Um, they could be you know drinking a ton of milk um, in excess but um, people can also be on calcium um, tablets for um, health reasons. For example they may have been prescribed it for osteoporosis or in chronic kidney disease as a phosphate binder and uh, it's possible that they could have those calcium tablets in excess causing um, hypercalcemia. Um, a fourth major category to consider is excessive calcitriol. So similarly this could be due to having um, an excessive ingestion of vitamin D. But various granulomatous diseases secrete calcitriol um, ectopically, that means sort of out of its normal place of production, which is in the kidney. Um, examples of this include TB and sarcoidosis. Um, and lymphoma is also another um, potential condition that can ectopically produce calcitriol, leading to hypercalcemia. And finally, you can get increased uh, calcium reabsorption from the kidneys, um, which you see in thiazide diuretics, and also in a condition called familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia which is uncommon, but commonly comes up 
Um, so to give you a quick explanation as to how that condition occurs, um, these people have a um, higher set point of calcium before they switch off the PTH um, gland. So basically they can tolerate a higher level of calcium than normal people do. And um, so they're sitting there with their higher level of calcium and PTH is continuously being pumped out of the parathyroid gland. Um, and that parathyroid hormone drives this continual renal reabsorption of calcium um, causing this hypocalciuria or low calcium in the urine and resulting in hypercalcemia. Going now into the assessment of hypercalcemia, uh, you should start by assessing whether someone is symptomatic of it or not. And you may have heard of the mnemonic stones, bones, groans, moans, psychiatric overtones. And that's a really handy mnemonic to have, have on hand to uh, remember the different clinical manifestations of hypercalcemia. And to go through it all really quickly, you can get uh, renal colic, bone pain, fractures, apto pain, nausea, vomiting, constipation. Um, you can get polyuria and polydipsia because hypercalcemia can induce a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. That is, it can make the um, kidney um, not respond to ADH, causing a polyuria. And the uh, psychiatric um, disturbances you could get include psychosis, mood disturbances, confusion, uh, even coma in some cases. So the next thing to do is to do a malignancy screen when you're assessing patients with hypercalcemia. We saw in the previous slides how common it is that malignancy causes hypercalcemia. And it's actually a late finding in malignancy and a poor prognostic sign. So you may already have that history of malignancy on hand. But if you've got a patient with undifferentiated hypercalcemia, particularly one that was rapidly progressive and um, rose to a really high, severe number very fast, you have to be thinking of malignancy. Um, and you can start um, asking questions like um, constitutional symptoms like fever, night sweats, weight loss, um, malaise, loss of appetite. You can feel for lymphadenopathy and, and do a general head-to-toe screen for um, signs of malignancy. You may consider doing um, imaging such as a CT, chest, abdo and pelvis um, as a result of this and doing age-appropriate screening like um, mammography, uh, colonoscopies, pap smears, um, looking for a cause of hypercalcemia um, if appropriate. So there are a few medications that you need to remember that may be um, contributing to your hypercalcemia. We already talked about vitamin D, calcium and thiazide diuretics, um, but lithium is also another one to note. Uh, it causes a hypercalcemia in a very similar way that FHH causes hypercalcemia in that it raises the set point of calcium required to switch off the parathyroid gland and so um, people on lithium tolerate a high level of calcium um, to normal people, resulting in their hypercalcemia. The final step to assessing hypercalcemia is to get a gauge of a patient's fluid balance. So patients can be quite volume depleted with hypercalcemia, and that could be due to decreased oral intake from nausea induced by hypercalcemia. And hypercalcemia can also induce significant urinary water losses um, through their polyuria. And so you need to re replace all of that. The other thing is the mainstay of treatment in hypercalcemia is to give IV fluids to flush out all that calcium. And if you've got a patient who has a tendency for fluid overload to begin with, for example, if they've got a history of CCF or renal impairment, you need to take that into consideration and have a good idea of what their baseline fluid balance is um, so you don't overload them with fluids in your therapy. Then when assessing a hypercalcemia, you're going to want to get a number of key investigations. So firstly, starting from your corrected calcium, of course, corrected for albumin, you've got to look at your renal function. It's useful for a couple of reasons. So we already talked about how you can get quite volume depleted with um, hypercalcemia. And so that could lead to a pre-renal AKI. But you could also get a post-renal AKI because you can get um, nephrolysis as a clinical manifestation of hypercalcemia and that could lead to an obstructive uropathy. And there are certain causes of hypercalcemia that lead to renal impairment, such as multiple myeloma. So that's why the renal function is handy. But the most important investigation by far for figuring out um, the cause of hypercalcemia is a parathyroid hormone. 
and we can see how that plays out on the next slide. Also helpful are some vitamin D levels, uh, PTH, uh, RP, if you can get a lab that does that test for you, as well as a myeloma screen. Also note that you can get some conduction abnormalities as a result of hypercalcemia. Particularly, you may see a short QT on an ECG, so that's also handy to do. The first thing you want to do when you're working out the cause of hypercalcemia is to check the PTH. So you're going back to normal physiology, we know that PTH is released when the calcium is low. So in a setting of hypercalcemia, if you have a high or high normal PTH, that's an abnormal response. And so you're dealing with a PTH-dependent hypercalcemia, that PTH is driving this. And it's usually because of primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, there are a few people out there who have FHH. Um, if you remember, that's a condition where they have a higher set point of calcium that they can tolerate before they switch off the parathyroid gland. Um, and so in these people, if you do a 24-hour urinary calcium excretion, you'll find that the calcium is low because they've got hypocalciuria. Um, but otherwise, um, most patients with a high PTH, high calcium, are more likely going to have primary hyperparathyroidism. It's worth mentioning tertiary hyperparathyroidism. They have a very similar, similar picture biochemically to primary hyperparathyroidism. But the, um, the clinical clue that will help you figure out these people is the fact that they've got a history of chronic kidney disease and a long-standing history of secondary hyperparathyroidism before they transition into tertiary um, hyperparathyroidism. So... Um, for everyone else, um, the normal response, like I said, is to suppress PTH, so to find it on the low or lower normal side of um, things. And so that's a PTH-independent hypercalcemia. And the most common cause of that would be malignancy, which is where your malignancy screen is going to come in very handy. If you can get a PTH-RP level, that's great, and that would point you in that direction. Um, you may have a history of bony lysis on hand, do a myeloma screen to look for multiple myeloma. Um, other useful tests to do are vitamin D levels. So a 25 um, vitamin D when elevated will tell you history of vitamin D excess. And if you've got an elevated calcitriol, um, that could be due to granulomatous diseases like TB and sarcoidosis. So your next step there would be to do a chest X-ray to look for those classic sarcoid findings like bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy or uh, cavitating lesions in the case of TB. And then uh, lymphoma is the other big cause of ectopic calcitriol to consider. If none of your tests are elevated, you can consider all those rare um, causes of hypercalcemia that we talked about, like milk alkali syndrome. Um, we also talked about um, hyperthyroidism, Paget's disease, and so on. And um, you could probably get that, again, from your clinical history and astute judgment. The mainstay of treatment in hypercalcemia is IV fluids and a lot of it. Um, as a rule of thumb, you may be starting at a rate of 200 to 300 mils an hour of normal saline. But going a lot more gently in patients who have a tendency for fluid overload like CCF or history of renal impairment. In, in those kind of patients, you may be considering giving loop diuretics as well to prevent fluid overload um, and also as a way of excreting calcium too. Um, the role of IV fluids is to replace the volume depletion that patients with hypercalcemia may have and also to basically flush out that calcium through the urine and dilute it in the serum. Another treatment for hypercalcemia is IV bisphosphonates such as zoledronic acid and permidronate. So these treatments work by inhibiting osteoclast action on bone. So if you remember, osteoclasts are the uh, cells in bone that um, cause resorption and release of calcium from bone, and that's what you're trying to inhibit. Um, these medications take about 48 to 72 hours to work, but they have a duration of action for about a couple of weeks, uh, so they're very powerful. Um, what you need to know about them is that they have a few side effects, like nausea and vomiting, they can cause flu-like symptoms. And you may have heard about a rare side effect called osteonecrosis of the jaw. Um, it's very uncommon, but more likely is to occur if patients have poor dental um, hygiene or poor dentition. So that's what you need a screen for before you start them on these um, therapies. The other thing is you need to make sure that patients are vitamin D replete before you start them on IV bisphosphonates.
sort of risk is if you've got a patient who's vitamin D deficient and you give bisphosphonates, you may trigger a hypocalcemia um, in the resulting weeks that followed um, the use of bisphosphonate therapy. There's another therapy called calcitonin um, that you can use in hypercalcemia. If you remember, calcitonin is a, a natural hormone that occurs, um, gets produced by the thyroid gland to counterbalance the effects of PTH. Um, calcitonin works more quickly than bisphosphonate, so it has an effect within 24 to 48 hours. But the effect of uh, calcitonin is quite short-lived, so beyond 48 hours, it's no longer effective. Any patients who've identified um, ectopic calcitriol production as being the driver of hypercalcemia, steroids are really powerful in switching that off, and so that's a relevant therapy that you need to consider to treat their hypercalcemia effectively. So let's talk about a few clinical cases so you can see how you um, can take all that knowledge you've just learned and uh, implement it all in real life. So we've got a 63-year-old gentleman here, a real case to present to Blue Mountains Hospital with three weeks history of back pain. He initially did his back while gardening, but it was just getting worse despite taking NSAIDs and pain fought from his GP. So he presented to emergency. And interestingly, he also had some GI symptoms, had a, had a week of constipation, uh, some nausea for two days and some mild abdominal pain. And this is all in a background of hypertension on Kenicide and the HCT. And so the ED doctors at Blue Mountains had decided to do um, blood tests and found a significant renal impairment when compared to the GP's outpatient bloods in the past with a crown of 508, HFR of 10. And so this guy was transferred to Nepean as a renal admission. And the um, assumption here is that this patient has a pre-renal AKI from several nephrotoxics like candesada and HCT and um, meloxicam. However, when he arrives at ED at Nepean, the ED boss decides to add on a CMP, and this is what he finds. As you can see, there is a severe hypercalcemia to level 3.42 with a creatinine of 489, EGFR of 10. And um, the, this renal impairment in the setting of hypercalcemia could be due to lots of reasons, as I outlined earlier, like volume depletion and post-renal um, AKI from obstructive uropathy. But um, in this case, you also have to consider multiple myeloma as being a cause for this. And as you can see, when I did the myeloma screen, the lambda light chains are through the roof. Of course, when you're working up hypercalcemia, you really need to know that PTH level. And as you can see there, it's low. It's appropriately suppressed as expected with a normal vitamin D level to suggest that it's not vitamin D excess driving this hypercalcemia. And so the next step for this gentleman would be to do a skeletal survey to see the extent of his bony involvement with myeloma. In terms of how they treated this guy, they gave him IV fluids and quite gently given that renal impairment. Um, and also, they had to eventually give him IV bisphosphonates. They were very hesitant to initially, given his poor renal function. And like I said, you have to be really careful with the creatinine clearance when um, giving bisphosphonates. Um, but eventually, they caved and gave him IV permidronate at a dose reduced amount um, after his hypercalcemia wasn't really responding to IV fluids. And they also treated him with um, subcut calcitonin in an effort to bring the calcium down. So this is another patient, a 90-year-old female admitted under Jerry's following a fall secondary to a UTI. And you can see a past medical history there, classic Jerry's patient with many comorbidities, um, notably a few um, vasculopathic sort of conditions like AF, um, insulin-dependent diabetes, myelitis, hypertension, and hypercholesterolemia. And she's also got a history of CCF. And she's got this high calcium of 2.89. Um, and if you remember the most common causes of hypercalcemia is malignancy and uh, primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, and it's important to do that PTH level. So as you can see from that PTH, uh, it's elevated, um, it's 12.6, which shows that she's got a PTH dependent hypercalcemia, which more likely than not is going to be caused by primary hyperparathyroidism. But you need to rule out FHH. So endocrine suggested a next step should be to do a 24-hour urinary calcium excretion, but also to do a thyroid ultrasound looking for parathyroid adenoma, which is more likely the cause of this patient's hypercalcemia.
Um, it's been persistently elevated as well since 2014, which sort of lowers your suspicion for causes like malignancy because malignancy usually causes a very acute, rapidly progressive rise in calcium. And she was managed with slow IV fluids. Um, given her renal impairment that you can see there, and also a history of CCF. Now, this renal impairment is actually new. Compared to a previous renal function two months ago, she had an EGFR of um, 65. And so she underwent an AKI screen, which included um, looking for multiple myeloma and a CTKUB. And the myeloma screen is not expected to be positive given that um, elevated PTH. You'd expect um, PTH to be suppressed like the previous case. And um, in this patient's case, the myeloma screen was negative, of course. But um, her CTKUB interestingly showed multiple renal calculi, as well as a bilateral hydronephrosis, suggesting obstructive uropathy causing her um, AKI, causing a post-renal AKI. And for her, it's interesting because she's been persistently hypercalcemic. And you know that renal calculi is a manifestation of um, hypercalcemia. Uh, and you can see how that played out in this case. There are three main takeaways after all this that I want you to bring away from this presentation. The first one, as I've stressed multiple times, is that the majority of hypercalcemia is due to primary hyperparathyroidism or malignancy. So that's what you should be looking for first. Parathyroid hormone is also very key to figuring out the cause of hypercalcemia. You need to know if this is uh, dependent or independent of PTH. And thirdly, the mainstay of treatment of hypercalcemia is IV fluids. You may consider other therapies like bisphosphonates, calcitonin, and steroids, but for the most part, you'll be really relying on those IV fluids to treat this patient. So we're going to move on to hypocalcemia now, firstly talking about the different causes of hypocalcemia. So apologies for a very messy slide again, but we've basically superimposed a deranged processes in the opposite direction onto that very familiar diagram to show you how that can all lead to hypocalcemia. So one obvious cause of hypocalcemia is low dietary intake of calcium. Another important cause is vitamin D deficiency, um, and that could be due to many reasons. We'll quickly go through the vitamin D metabolism um, pathway on the next slide. Um, another important cause of hypocalcemia is hypoparathyroidism or a lack of PTH and that is usually iatrogenically induced. Um, so the parathyroid gland can be damaged during a thyroidectomy or um, when you're giving radioactive iodine to people with Graves' disease. Um, but there are other causes of hypoparathyroidism. Uh, it could be congenital, it can be autoimmune. It can also get infiltrates into the parasite gland, like in the case of hemochromatosis or malignancy. Um, then you've also got uh, increased bony deposition or inhibition of bony resorption causing hypocalcemia. And so in that case, you've got the bone sort of holding on to that calcium and failing to release it into the bloodstream. And that could be because of osteoblastic metastases or osteoporosis drugs like bisphosphonates and denosumab. Um, those bone drugs particularly will cause hypocalcemia in the setting of vitamin D deficiency occurring concurrently as well, like we mentioned previously. And the final major category of hypocalcemia to think about is the binding up of freely ionized calcium. Um, so if you've got anions in excess, for example, like in hyperphosphatemia or um, excessive citrate, you're going to um, have a resulting hypocalcemia and um, citrate particularly is found as an anticoagulant in a lot of blood products. So you've got someone who's got a massive amount of blood transfusions going through, like say they've had the massive transfusion protocol activated, you can in theory get a hypocalcemia as a result of excessive citrate. Now, the way acute pancreatitis binds up ionized calcium is through the release of a lipase. So lipase uh, breaks down fats into fatty acids, and it's those fatty acids that cling on to calcium in a process called saponification, and, and that causes hypocalcemia. So I just want to talk about vitamin D deficiency a bit more. You can see that any impairment in the step process um, illustrated on the left can lead to vitamin D deficiency. So as you guys remember from basic physiology, you've got this compound called 7-dehydrocholesterol in the skin that gets activated by UV light and through a series of steps eventually becomes the active form of vitamin D, which is calcitriol. 
activated in the kidneys. And so inadequate sun exposure can lead to vitamin D deficiency. And there's a few dietary sources of vitamin D as well, um, particularly like oily fish, for example. So poor diet can lead to this. In addition to a GI malabsorption, so you remember that vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, and if there's an issue with um, absorption in the gut of that, you can cause um, a vitamin D deficiency. So examples of GI malabsorptive disorders include celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and bariatric surgery. And then you can have a problem in activating um, calcidiol into the, uh, the active form of vitamin D, like in the case of chronic kidney disease. And that lack of calcitriol is a key component in the pathophysiology of secondary hyperparathyroidism, which I'll go through on the next slide. So secondary hyperparathyroidism can seem like a very confusing topic, but it doesn't need to be. All you need to know is that in a patient with chronic kidney disease, there's two processes at hand that sort of drive this secondary hyperparathyroidism in the end. And the two processes that are going out of whack is a reduction in calcitriol because the kidneys aren't able to activate as much calcitriol as a normal person would. And the other problem is the fact that they really suck at excreting out phosphate. I mean, the kidneys at this stage pretty much suck at excreting everything, but particularly phosphate is a problem here. So the lack of calcitriol um, leads to a reduction in calcium absorption from the gut, uh, from the kidneys and from the bones. And that in itself causes hypocalcemia. But the fact that you've got a hyperphosphatemia in the blood is a double whammy because all that um, excessive phosphate complexes with all the freely ionized uh, calcium in the blood and that causes a further hypocalcemia, um, which then triggers a response by the parathyroid gland to produce PTH as a response to that. And that's what we know as secondary hyperparathyroidism, a normal response to that hypocalcemia as a result of CKD. Now, over time, the parathyroid gland is going to compensate for this. It may become very hyperplastic. It may develop adenomas. And then over time, these adenomas or hyperplasia can lead to an autonomous secretion of parathyroid hormone. And then this then morphs into a picture of tertiary hyperparathyroidism that biochemically mimics a primary hyperparathyroidism. So they're going to have a high PTH high calcium over time because of this hyperplasia. When assessing a patient with hypocalcemia, you're basically looking for symptoms and signs of tetany. So that's um, this abnormal muscle contractional spasm. So they're going to complain of, yeah, muscle spasms, cramps. They could get diaphragmatic spasms, which lead to dyspnea, and can in severe cases lead to respiratory arrest. And they also commonly complain of uh, pins and needles or tingling, so paresthesia around the, um, the mouth or perioral area, and also in the hands and feet. And they can also get a few sort of mental health uh, psychiatric manifestations as well in terms of like, emotional lability and psychosis. So there are a couple of classic signs that you need to know for hypocalcemia. And you can see how those signs look in real life through that YouTube link I've provided there. The first one is Schwastek sign. So that's a facial muscle spasm that occurs when you tap on the facial nerve. Um, and you're tapping essentially anterior to the tragus on the cheek. And a trousseau sign is a um, sign that occurs when you're taking a patient's blood pressure. If you um, basically have the blood pressure cuff inflated above systolic blood pressure for a certain amount of time, you've got to cause this ischemia to the nerves that causes a bit of an irritation and um, leads to a carbapetal spasm. And what that is, it, you've got this flexion at the MCP joints involuntarily by the patient as a result of hypocalcemia. The investigations for hypocalcemia are very similar to hypercalcemia. This time around, when you're getting the CMP, you're not only paying a lot of attention to the level of the calcium, we are also looking at the magnesium and the phosphate. So we've already talked about how high phosphate can lead to hypocalcemia. The other thing to know is that low magnesium can go hand in hand with low calcium. And so magnesium is key for um, parathyroid hormone release from the parathyroid gland. Um, and also a low magnesium can cause a resistance to the action of parathyroid hormone. And so you need to see if it's low and replace it accordingly if it is. Parathyroid hormone, as usual, is very key to figuring out um, what's causing your hypocalcemia. And the renal function is very helpful. If you've got a history of CKD, then you can 
um, saved as a, a secondary hyperparathyroidism driving your low calcium. Uh, vitamin D levels, of course, looking for vitamin D deficiency is handy. And the ECG is also helpful because you want to be looking for prolonged QT, which can um, deteriorate into torsade de point, which is a very life-threatening arrhythmia that you don't want to miss. So the first step when working up hypocalcemia is to check the mag. So if it's low, um, you need to address that because that can be your cause of hypocalcemia or you could exacerbate it if you're not addressing it as well. So treat that mag deficiency. The second step is to check the PTH. So going back to normal physiology, we expect the PTH to be released, to be you know high in the case of hypocalcemia. So if it's low, it's inappropriately low. And so that suggests a cause of hypoparathyroidism driving that hypocalcemia. But in the instance that it's appropriately high, you need to look at the renal function and the vitamin D levels to see if there's a secondary hyperparathyroidism or vitamin D deficiency causing your hypocalcemia. Um, if these tests are um, you know, normal, then you have to be thinking of other causes of hypocalcemia. And that's just going back to the clinical history and assessment that you did looking for drugs like bisphosphonates or denosumab triggering this or, um, you know, um, excessive citrate, uh, acute pancreatitis and so on and so forth, looking for a reason for why someone will be hypocalcemic. The treatment of hypocalcemia is very straightforward. So they're low in calcium, so you give it. And um, you need to give it in an IV form, particularly if it's severe hypocalcemia or symptomatic with tetany. Um, also replace the magnesium if they're deficient and replace vitamin D if they're deficient in that as well. And in the case of CKD um, and secondary hyperparathyroidism, remember back to the pathophys that that's being driven by two main problems, a lack of calcitriol and hyperphosphatemia. And so that's why the treatment in CKD is to give phosphate binders to um, reduce that phosphate level and to replace that calcitriol deficiency with calcitriol, of course. So going through a case in the wards, we've got the 60-year-old female who was admitted again under renal, referred by her GP due to a, what seemed like an AKI with a creatinine of 495 and an EGFR of 8, with no previous history of uh, renal problems at all. She's got a background of hypertension on three antihypertensive agents and a history of hypothyroidism on thyroxin. And she present to a GP in the first place because she had a week of uh, exertional dyspnea that wasn't getting any better. And you can see on the initial bloods um, in ED, her calcium was severely low. She had a calcium 1.62 and a high phosphate of 2.45 with a normal magnesium. So when assessing this patient with hypocalcemia, we first ruled out symptoms and signs of tetany. And we found no bisphosphonates or denosumab on her list of medications. And given the history of hypothyroidism, we specifically asked whether she underwent a thyroidectomy or radioactive iodine, which she denied, which is important because there are causes of iatrogenic hypoparathyroidism. She underwent a CTKUB as part of an AKI screen to look for post-renal causes of AKI. Instead, we found bilaterally atrophic kidneys, which suggests a history of CKD that was unbeknownst to her. And so this lady had acute on chronic renal failure, thought to be due to hypertensive nephropathy, given that she had resistant hypertension on three agents. And because of that, she developed an anemia of um, chronic kidney disease with a HB of 50, 55, I believe, on admission. And she also had the complication of secondary hyperparathyroidism, which is what caused her, her low calcium and high phosphate. And so because of this, they treated her severely low calcium with IV calcium gluconate. They gave her EPO replacement to treat the anemia, as well as gave her iron replacement. And to treat the secondary hyperparathyroidism, they gave her calcitriol, as well as calcium carbonate to not only bump up her calcium levels, but to bind up all that excess phosphate. So in terms of takeaways for assessing and managing a patient with hypocalcemia, you want to first look for symptoms and signs of tetany and think about the main causes of hypocalcemia as a lack of parathyroid hormone, um, secondary hyperparathyroidism or vitamin D deficiency. They're probably the three major categories to think about. And um, you want to be treating hypocalcemia, of course, with calcium replacement um, and sometimes vitamin D replacement as well if they're deficient.
And don't forget the magnesium. So people with hypocalcemia can have a concurrent hypomagnesemia that you also need to address to fix the calcium. So that concludes my presentation on hyper and hypocalcemia. Um, I know they're very confusing topics, and so if there's anything that wasn't quite clear from the presentation, please feel free to email me. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, but otherwise, um, good luck with all your studies. You guys are going to be amazing junior doctors, and look forward to seeing you all on the wards. Goodbye!